Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, welcome everybody to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. And we are on our, gosh, 281st episode, which is very exciting. We want to thank everybody who listens, watches, and reads Must Read Alaska. Uh, we can't thank you enough. We're top 200 on iTunes in four different countries on any given time. And we have millions of people that visit our website every single month. And uh, we just started a new newsletter, which is very exciting off of Substack. So if you want to subscribe to that newsletter, all you have to do is go to mustreadalaska.com. And on the top there, you'll see a little newsletter button. Click on that bad boy and then type in your email address and you will be subscribed to our Substack newsletter. If you help keep the, if you want to help keep the lights on at Must Read Alaska, we are funded by just everyday folks that care about uh, producing conservative news uh, in, in Alaska. And we're just funded $5, $10. $100 at a time. We're not funded by some big nonprofit conglomerate. Uh, we're just funded by everyday folks in Alaska. So if you do help already keep the lights on at Must Read Alaska, we want to thank you. But man, do I have a special guest today, Mark Lindquist. And I want to I want to intro Mark before I welcome him to the show because this is a special treat, excuse me, for folks in Alaska. Mark is the author of several very successful books and just let me read some of these reviews for you. Linquist captures the zeitgeist. He does what no one has done well before, Buffalo News. Echoes and ties to both Hemingway and Fitzgerald, Boston Globe. Dialogue that's absolutely pitch perfect, Washington Post. And the list goes on and on. I think anytime you can be called perfect by the Washington Post, I think the critics love your book. He's also been labeled as Amer one of America's uh, Best Bachelors by People Magazine. So without further ado, Mark, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show. Good morning, John. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on what I now learn is the 281st show. So that's cool. <laughs> it's very exciting. So Mark, tell us a little bit about kind of where you grew up. Take us back, all the way back, where you grew up and what first got you uh, into a, a love relationship with writing. All the way back, yeah, I, I should have uh, brought with me some screen share pictures of me playing Gildobi football because I was just sharing those <laughs> with my daughter recently. I grew up in the Matthews Beach area of Seattle. And to answer how that you know, led to me being a writer, that's a little difficult to unravel. But I think really in summary, it's just I was a reader. And so I became a writer. Nice. So one of your... Um... One of your first books, uh, you know, your first book, tell us about what it was like to write your first book. Cause it's, it's one thing, you know, to growing up in Seattle and you kind of have a thing for writing. It's a whole nother thing to write your first book. So talk to us a little bit about what that first book was first book was, if I could talk and uh, you know, was it successful right away? Was it a sol slow roller? The critics loved it. Talk to us a little bit about your first book. So my first book, it sounds like you're referring to my first published book. Uh, I should mention that was preceded by what I consider my first book, uh, which I wrote right after college on an IBM Selector typewriter. <laughs> and, you know, and I sent it out to publishers. I had no agent, of course. And I sent it out to publishers. And I wish I'd saved the rejection slips because that's kind of a rite of passage for writers is having those rejection slips. Uh, but the book you're referring to was written a few years later uh, in my mid-20s, and it was set in Venice, California, where I was uh, living and working. And the book's about a young writer who's living and working in Venice, California. So not particularly imaginative, but just kind of chronic chronicled my period uh, in my mid-20s in Los Angeles. Nice. Well, if, uh, you know, Wiki Wikipedia says that you were part of a Brat Pack. Now, tell us about, everybody knows the Brat Pack of the actor industry. Um, tell us about what Wikipedia is talking about with the Brat Pack of the writer industry. 
Well, as for Wikipedia, I have to confess, I've never uh, read anything on Wikipedia. <laughs> <Don't use laughs> Wikipedia. I didn't even know this was on Wikipedia. Um, that said, I think what it's referring to, I know what it's referring to, and that is that there was a group of youngish writers uh, they were all kind of hanging out together in the 80s. And it was a rip on uh, the Brat Pack, which was an article that came out about Rob Lowe and Charlie Sheen and a group of then very hot young actors. And so somebody took that same marketing brand and just switched it over to writers. And, you know, here's the thing about, you know, writers. It's so very difficult to get any publicity as a writer for your book. You uh, take every opportunity you can get. Uh, cheesy or not. And it really started, I think, primarily with Brett and Jay. That is, Brett Easton Ellis and Jay McInerney, um, you know, were very, at that time, popular writers. Brett had just written Less Than Zero. Jay had written Bright Lights, Big City just prior to that. And then there was Tama Janowitz, who wrote Slaves in New York in that same time period. Uh, and really what they had in common was, you know, young writers, um, good books, and a lot of publicity. And they did, in fact, all hang out together, as did I, which is kind of how I think I got linked in with them. I knew Brett uh, before my first book came out, and my first book was published by and edited by Gary Fiskajohn, who is the editor and publisher of Bright Lights, Big City. So that was kind of my connection into that group. And through Brett and Jay, I met Tama Janowitz and a lot of other New York characters. Well, this is, uh, for folks that are listening, you also have a full-time day job. You've been an elected, I think, district attorney in Pierce County, Washington. Uh, folks that know you in and around Pierce County, um, I have several friends that know you, and they can't say enough good things about you and how nice of a person you are and always willing to pick up the phone uh, to listen to them when you were an elected official. So talk to us about your full-time job that you did on the side and what that was like for you because my guess is uh being a public being in the public service arena especially as an attorney uh long hours and all those kinds of things what was it like juggling those two things well i appreciate hearing that about your friends thank you you know when i was a public servant i did pride myself on you know being accessible to people. Now, that said, that was a later stage of my life. When I was a writer, I was a full-time writer for almost a decade. Um, you know, because I'm not hanging out and partying with Brett and Jay till three in the morning and then reporting to the office you know, <laughs> to serve the public the next morning. So different chapters in the, the, the life there. But in terms of public service and how I got there, um, you know, I had my first book came out. And then my second book came out and I was also making the bulk of my, like a lot of novels at that time, I was making the bulk of my money from screenwriting. And this was also an era where you could get pretty, pretty handsomely to do magazine articles. Uh, and I did articles for Details Magazine and some others. Um, but novels and even one that sold well, uh, relatively well, like my first one, my second one did not, by the way, but even novels that sell relatively well, it's tough to make a living just off of books. You know, if you're not Stephen King or someone who's selling a mass amount of copies. And I have actually always meant to go to law school. And, you know, I grew up around public service, um, you know, will probably later in this podcast lament what has become of politics and public service. But at the time, you know, I thought, well, it's a noble endeavor because as I said, I grew up around it. And I meant to go to law school. And I got to a point with my writing career after about a decade, I wanted to take a break. And uh, instead of, you know, lying on a beach in Bali or maybe going <laughs> over to, you know, the Czech Republic or to see what was going on, I went to law school. And I was actually still under contract to a studio, uh, Disney, I think it was, when I went to law school. So my first year of law school, I was actually flying back and forth for story meetings from Seattle to Los Angeles. But after law school, um, I started in a prosecutor's office and you know, worked my way up through the ranks to be a you know, trial team chief, the chief criminal deputy, and then eventually the elected. So do you have a favorite case that you've uh, been a part of over the years? I know you have went from um, kind of being in the public service to now, I think you have your own law firm, but do you have a favorite case that sticks out to you over the years and why? 
Yeah, there, there are a couple. Um, I think one of the strengths I brought to trial work was as a writer, I understood the story and jurors understand the world in terms of story, right? Um, you know, if you just throw a bunch of facts at a jury, you can see their eyes start to glaze over. Uh, they want to hear a story. They want to hear the story of what happened. And a couple of cases that really stand out in my memory were number one, the Tacoma Mall shooting, mm. uh, because I still remember my opening line in opening statement, because this kid who shot up the mall called 911 just before he went in and started shooting. And the 911 operator uh, asked the right question, which is, you know, where are you? And he said back to her, just follow the screams. Mm. And it was such a staged line, you know, just follow the screams that that became the theme of the trial, which is, you know, he wanted attention. And the way he got attention uh, was to shoot up the mall. So that, that one sticks in my memory. And then there was another homicide case I did that was, you know, usually real life homicide trials are not like movie homicide trials. They're not like CSI. Uh, but there was one case I had where this guy had a mistress, a girlfriend, and a wife. And That's this, a lot to keep up with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know how anyone has the, the time or inclination for that, but he did. And he decided one day, uh, on the same day, he was going to divorce the wife, murder the mistress, and leave town with the girlfriend. And that one's always, that was actually a tough case, but it came together. My co-counsel, Jared Osser, just did a really remarkable job of putting the pieces together of the forensics. You know, we had no witness to the murder, um, but we put it together by forensics and it was reminiscent actually of, it's one of the few cases I've had that actually was reminiscent of a CISI episode. So um, you've written, you know, I think four books, lots of, articles and helping screenwrite movies and tv shows do you have one in particular that sets apart in that arena that sticks out as one that's been the most impactful in your life uh, over the course of the number of years the book that sticks with me is never mind nirvana which you know you can see a publicity poster over my shoulder there and it sticks with me one because i think i probably did the best job I've ever done in terms of capturing a time and a place and a mood. Uh, and secondly, it brings me back to that time and place and mood. Mm. And finally, it's something that's still live. You know, I still get emails from it. Um, people still send me copies to sign. And I'm talking to Brian Koppelman, who did the movie Rounders, one of my favorite movies. And that movie. also the TV show Billions. And I've been working on a pilot for Nevermind Nirvana for him. So my favorite, especially now, since I'm continuing to dig back into it, whereas, you know, most of my work I, you do and you move on. So what's the what's the secret behind, you know, if somebody were to look up your book reviews, like literally the critics love your books. I don't I couldn't find a bad review. You got everything from the New York Times to the Boston Globe to everything in between. Everybody says your books are amazing. That's usually a critic. Uh, that's very hard to come by to find only amazing reviews. What's been the secret sauce for you to have the critics adore you? Well, first I can assure you there are a couple of critics out there who definitely do not adore me. <laughs> um, but I, and I, it's good you were not apparently able to find them. Um, but in terms of the critics who really love these books, and I agree with you, some have been uh, really enthusiastic. I think in the case of Nevermind Nirvana, I think they were fellow music fans. Mm. You know, they loved the same things that I loved, um, and that helped them love the book. Uh, that's only, I mean, that's the only explanation I can think of on Nevermind, because if you, some of the critics who wrote some of the best reviews on Nevermind Nirvana, yeah, I was like, oh, I know that guy. He's really into this band. <laughs> He's, you know, he, and so I think we had we started with a common band. I mean, never mind Nirvana, for those of your readers who don't know, 
is set in the Seattle music scene of the 90s. And it's about a guy who just couldn't live without music. Mm. And I think that struck a chord with a lot of these, uh, a lot of the critics. In fact, we, in Nevermind Nirvana's case, some of the reviewers were not book reviewers. They were like the music critic for the paper. Yes, yeah, so the magazine it. who got their hands in the book and were able to write a review. You probably took them back to the place that they remember fond memories of in 1994 or 1993. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what advice would you give somebody, Mark? You've had a successful career, both as being an author um, and uh, an attorney, both in the public sector and the private sector. You're going to have people that are listening to this who want to try something. Maybe they want to start a business. Maybe they want to write their first uh, article submission to a newspaper. Maybe they want to write their first book. Lots of people don't start because they have just fear of the unknown. What's your advice to somebody who wants to start something that they've never started before? You know, I will actually tell you a quick story that segues into that. I was in a poker group back in the day. And this is when we were all aspiring writers or aspiring actors or aspiring directors with the emphasis on aspiring. And almost everyone at that poker table um, became successful professionally, uh, some massively so. Uh, Peter Fairley, for example, was one of our poker group who went on to do Dumb and Dumber and Something mm -hmm. About Mary and was recently won an Academy Award for Green Book. And the common theme, I think, um, of those who succeeded was simply, uh, you'd like to think it was, you know, talent, uh, but really it was ambition. It was persistence, which isn't to say there wasn't talent there. But I knew a lot of people in Los Angeles who were talented and were not ultimately successful with that talent. Um, and it really was a question of putting in the work. And when I say ambitious, I mean, you know, ambition that's actually executed, uh, mm -hmm. that is doing the work. And I think that applies in, you know, in any profession. Specific to writing, I think, you know, you got to be, a, you know, read. Probably the best advice I ever got as a writer was read and write. And if you read and you write and you keep doing it, you'll get there. So who's been a <clears throat> who's been a hero to you over the years, uh, think, Mark, and why? Yeah, the, you know, there have been a few heroes at different stages. And I think actually that ties back to your question, which is, you know, how, how do you succeed? And one of the ways I think you succeed in any endeavor is find a good mentor. You know, use the word hero. But I think mentors are just so important. And if you read Ryan Holiday, who wrote The Obstacles of the Way, um, he talks, I think, very eloquently about the importance of mentors. So to, to answer your question about mentors, um, some, you know, some of my mentors were, I suppose, aren't true mentors in that they're dead. You know, like, for, you know, for example, if you're heavily influenced by Hemingway, you not only read everything Hemingway wrote, um, but you read all about it. You know, how did he become a writer? What were his work practices? Um, you know, one of the things that stands out in my memory is uh, Joan Didion. One of the things she used to do is literally sit down at a typewriter and type up stories she liked that other people had written, you know, as a way to get a really break down what those writers were doing. So I, I have a hard, hard time saying to what I would call, you know, heroes through the years, but um, I've been very fortunate to have some good mentors through the years uh, where I, soaked up as much as I could from them. And then eventually, you know, the apprentice uh, often surpasses the master. Well, I, th I think that's a awesome point. And I think that uh, for folks that are listening, it's also important, you know, if you have mentors in your life to also be mentoring other people, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lost art because we're on this thing all day, the phone. Right. Um, it, it's uh, getting back to the old school of actually talking to people actually does the soul good. So, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest advantage of writer groups, not necessarily that, uh, you know, it improves your writing, but that it inspires you to write. Um, you almost feel obligated to 
you know, get those new pages out uh, before you meet with the group again. You know, whatever it takes for people to, again, do the reading, do the writing, do the work. Well, what's next for you, Mark? You touched on the movie script thing. Uh, you know, what's what's next for you on the horizon in the in the author world? Well, in the author world, I actually have a novel I was working on for a while, but I took a break from that to work on this pilot for Nevermind Nirvana. Uh, I do not have, at this point, as much time for writing as I would like. Um, part of my thinking behind forming a new firm was that I might free up some more time to write. Uh, and I still uh, hold that, optimistically hold that idea in mind. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Uh, in fact, the, the new firm's been very time consuming. I was really blessed when I uh, got out of the prosecutor's office uh, to hook up with a firm. And my first case was the crash of the Boeing 737 MAX 8 in Indonesia. Oh, wow. Right. And then there was a second crash three months later on my birthday, actually, in Ethiopia. I still have one of the cases from the crash in Ethiopia. But my first year in practice, I worked almost exclusively on the Max crash in Indonesia. And all those cases have now been resolved. But it was a beautiful break from the mess that politics had become. Mm -hmm. And I actually spent a lot of that year in Indonesia. And, but I was with that firm and really grateful for the experiences I had with that firm for almost four years. And then I started a new firm last year. And I right now, um, my favorite clients are all with me. My favorite cases are all with me. And I haven't quite yet figured out a way to get a lot of writing time in. But, you know, I mentioned all that as a way of saying, what's next? Well, that's kind of the transition to get me to this new firm. And I think what's next is uh, the firm starts to get, you know, stabilized and I find some time for writing and I really would like to see this uh, pilot for Nevermind Nirvana catch on but uh, I've been around long enough to know these things are outside your control so I'm just trying to enjoy the process of revisiting that book. Awesome well last question to you is this what's the biggest lesson you learned in the life of being an elected um, district attorney it's a very strange a uh, place to politically be in, in my opinion, because you're tasked with doing your job, but you probably oftentimes being pulled in political directions that take you away from your job. So what's some of the lessons you've learned over the years from being in that kind of a uh, spectrum of job? You know, I enjoyed public service. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, um, I think I went in with... Uh, probably an underestimation of what you just mentioned, which is the number of forces that would be pulling you on to detours. Um, but I, I think the lesson learned there is, and it applies to anything else is, you know, stay true to yourself, stay true to your principles. Um, and I felt that no matter the distractions, I tried to stay focused on a few core principles. And I guess that would be the lesson is right. you know, know your values and, and stick to them. And especially now in politics, there's a temptation to get you know, drug into the proverbial mud. Oh. I think you just have to you know, keep your integrity, keep your professionalism and stay above the fray. I like that. Well, Mark, do you have any last minute thoughts before we head off here? No, I, I don't, but I, I appreciate you checking in and thank you and I'll keep you posted on where never mind Nirvana goes. And uh, you know, also, if you know, know anyone who needs a personal injury attorney down, down in the Seattle area, be sure to give me a call. Nice. Well, Mark, I really appreciate you coming on the Must Read Alaska show. And for folks that maybe just caught the tail end of this that are listening on Facebook or iTunes or wherever it may be, I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to the whole thing. Uh, Mark is an extremely successful author. He has his own law firm. And man, he was People Magazine's most eligible one of people magazine's most el eligible bachelors back in the day and probably and uh you probably have a couple copies of that magazine left but uh um we want to thank you for coming on mark and uh we're gonna have another show gosh and uh we're gonna have two more shows today so you're gonna want to tune in today's gonna be a packed day i have the uh, director of the iron dog and then i have spencer moore candidate 
uh, for a political office there in Anchorage. So until next time, I'm John Quick signing off from somewhere in Alaska. Thank you, John.